Dear viewers, this video essay is organized rather chaotically, but the most important stuff are past the half of the video and frankly to get them you need to watch the first half and especially the end, so yeah, enjoy. Saying that fascism is capitalism in decay became rather fashionable, it sort of became the latest sign of ideology signaling by Marxist teenagers and smug demagogues, but that aside, there haven't been any person, not to my knowledge at least, that would apply this similar logic into a different realm and say that maybe cultural Marxism is liberalism in decay. Liberalism had created a massive void that is now being filled with Marxism, which in many respects is similar to liberalism but also different as it is applied on a massive collective scale thereby limiting individual liberties that liberalism had effectively stood for in the past but most importantly it effectively became an antithesis to modern liberalism. Right away I'm predicting that some of you would probably get insulted straight away as liberalism stands for the protection of individual rights and freedoms which to a larger extent consists of protecting private property, participating in elections and of course voting with the wallet. Marxism of course stands for the opposite and frankly if I were arguing that they are similar in that regard I would look very stupid but this is not the only side of liberalism that we must be aware of. Liberalism as an economical ideology started only in the 19th century while as a political project it emerged with the works of the Enlightenment thinkers such as John Locke, Montesquieu, Rousseau and of course John Stuart Mill, the only post-Enlightenment philosopher. Now I want to be treating the Enlightenment as some sort of a monolith boogeyman as some of the NRX community perceive it to be and frankly I think that the application of reason to politics and a couple of other Enlightenment virtues are important to uphold. I'm not an anti-Enlightenment person and I think its benefits have outweighed its costs but unfortunately some of what we're dealing with right now definitely is a consequence of liberalism but a consequence that could only have happened due to a couple of reasons that is due to an erosion of social trust and cohesion and creation of movements and behaviors that actively work to erode it even further and eventually replace it by something else. And unfortunately it was not predicted by the early enlightenment figures who assumed that there won't be many cultures and group identities fighting for power in one place. What I'm saying is that liberalism had created a giant void which turned into an equal playing field of different ideologies and social movements competing for power. To prove my argument of how Marxism is the result of decaying liberalism even further, I will dwell into power analysis and a few quotations by Marxists, but first I need to explain what the hell it means in the first place, and I wish I could have done it earlier, but as I said my essay is not organized properly, but anyways what it is, why would it decay and why Marxism would naturally follow liberalism and not libertarianism or even fascism. To start off decay means to decline, therefore to erode some of its original quality. Liberalism as we know it used to be economically right wing and it still is in Europe, but now it has eroded its meaning, but what it has eroded the most was as I have mentioned previously, social trust, community orientation and perhaps the idea of tolerance when applied to certain social movements. And hence this is why fascism would never be the end of liberalism, because fascism openly reject the liberal framework unlike the Marxists who are more tricky, but in any event this is not some sort of a longing of the old days of liberalism as I don't consider myself to be one, even though I like freedom of speech and association to a limited degree as do most people, because usually in videos like this one there'll be a natural follow-up, right? And that is to return to the original virtues of liberalism that are getting eroded right now by the new dominant social narratives, or at least this is the solution proposed by James Lindsay. Another solution, this time by somebody even more radical than him, will be embracing libertarianism, which is a form of liberalism in its most radical and spiteful form, that as far as I'm concerned would bring us to our knees even further than the current eroding liberal elite, as it will 
will basically untie the hands of our enemies completely and will masquerade itself as some sort of a right-wing reactionary ideology and ultimately will create everything but order which in turn will create a free-for-all climate only creating a demand for order that will eventually of course be fulfilled by some variation of Marxism. As it would seem as the only cure as all other cures will be repressed by private companies that libertarianism is in defense of unless of course the right will get serious about economics so libertarianism is not liberalism in decay but rather it is some sort of a liberalism on steroids in its most destructive and spiteful form. Even the radical enlightenment philosophers such as Rousseau who have advocated for the complete emancipation of man through collective means of a general will understand this, but not other things. Man is born free but everywhere he is in chains and individual biological differences don't matter in the social sphere as Hobbes, Locke and Rousseau would all agree. Marx had essentially argued for the same thing and viewed emancipation to be on a collective scale with the dictatorship of the proletariat acting as another reiteration of Rousseau's general will. You might object and say that most liberals are individualistic, but historically they have recognized the collective community and they viewed the convention to be a social contract, which is not limited to just the governors and the governed. Building on my previous point, forces that I would identify to be culturally Marxist are embracing the collectivistic spirit in a call for power, even though more or less remaining capitalist economically, as economy is secondary to culture. But that is not even the most important point that I want to bring up today. Here's the actual deal. The main motto of the French Revolution, which was the Enlightenment project at its logical conclusion at the time, was liberty, equality and fraternity. The same three virtues that are repeated by Marxists of all sorts, thus creating a core similarity between them and the Enlightenment radicals and liberals. Marxists claim that they can bring about the aims of the Enlightenment, but even better. Of course, looking at history, we know it's BS, but as long as they don't hold any legislative power, they will be perceived as those wishing to bring about the social change. Knowing how our culture of today is obsessed with all kinds of equities, equalities, inclusions of all people except those who are not leftists and not of a majority descent, Marxism can be perceived as a logical continuation and fulfillment of the liberal enlightenment project by the people who have thought only a little bit of it, which most people do when they are adopting a political worldview, and that's what's sad, and especially it would be at the expense of liberalism. But wait a minute, are you arguing that Marxism is simply the logical continuation of liberalism and an attempt to achieve it in the most truest form? Isn't that what most Marxists have argued for historically? Is the slavery, feudalism, capitalism, socialism kind of a model? Well, yes and no. It is what they have argued for, sure, but you are wrong to assume that they were correct. Liberalism can only transform to Marxism only when it loses its central quality, just like it can transform into fascism or another progressive ideology. To be completely frank, libertarianism is actually the logical follow-up of liberalism and not Marxism as I have mentioned previously. But that aside, my main thesis is that the base by which liberalism used to operate, and I don't mean a material base, but rather a cultural base that is underpinned by shared values and social cohesion, the same cultural base and values that are being eroded by liberalism running wild right now, and of course Marxism that is allowed to rise by liberalism, which not only aims to erode our society even further, but also replace it with a cultural Marxist society. You see, the early theorists of liberalism, be it John Locke, Hobbes, Mill, or Rousseau, who was a radical, all understood that for an effort of their political system to work, a high degree of social cohesion is needed. Locke and Hobbes have advocated for a social contract of a sort. Mill had advocated against providing liberties to uncivilized people and Rousseau had advocated for a totalitarian system underpinned by a secular religion in order to achieve social cohesion and a high degree of social trust. 
If you look at our past, both of their prerequisites have been met, with secular religion was de facto Christianity, and the liberal system had survived almost two centuries in some places in the West. But now, as we don't have any church or any other common identity that would uphold us together, but instead have a lot of individualized and smug people and you know, group conflicts running all over the place, social trust is decreasing. John Stuart Mill could not have ever imagined that the West will be a multicultural society in the future, while people from cultures that Mill would consider to be uncivilized could influence the society in such a way as to create conflicts. This is why charity and social cohesion have been such a disaster in diverse areas. The old liberalism had operated due to a high degree of social trust shared cultural norms by a homogeneous population, but it can never operate in a multicultural place where people's views differ so harshly from one another. The modern version of liberalism does precisely that. It is nothing but an attempt to set up an equal playing field of different identity groups and ideologies that would compete against each other. That is, until one ideology or an identity group secures power and subjugates the rest and order a society in such a way as to make the other people conform to this new shared common values. That is what happened in the Soviet Union when the communists had secured power mass converting the people into their beliefs and shredding away any form of opposition that would stand in their way. The battle against religion was also intensified. This was organized by the Union of the Fighting Godless, led by a close associate of Stalin's. In 1935, the organization had more than 5 million atheist warriors. The state wanted to drive the church from the villages. The Bolsheviks reasoned it would be easier to force the peasantry into collectives if the economic, social, and cultural roots of the village were destroyed. Even the atheist movement had a five-year plan. Their stated goal was to eliminate God by 1937 and started doing so by destroying his houses of worship. In our contemplative reality, Marxism is simply that ideology which will take on liberalism and completely destroy it, as it is both collectivistic, therefore an action and power oriented, and has similar cultural aspirations as do most people, which is dealing with inequalities among other things. Weak liberalism, which is providing Marxists and other extremist ideologies with the exceptions of currently fascism and most of the right wing, with an equal playing field and a platform, is ultimately paving a way to Marxism. Ideological subversion is, is the slow process which we call either ideological subversion or active measures, active мероприятия in the language of, of the KGB, or psychological warfare. What it basically means is to change the perception of reality of every American to such an extent that despite of the abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensible conclusions in the interests of defending themselves, their families, their community and their country. It's a great brainwashing uh, process which goes very slow and it's divided in, in four basic stages. To best prove my case, let me quote you the father of cultural Marxism, Antonio Gramsci. Socialism is precisely the religion that must overwhelm Christianity. In the new order, socialism would triumph by first capturing the culture via infiltration of schools, universities and churches and the media by transforming the consciousness of society. To my surprise, Marx was also in favor of free trade as modern liberals are and for a very telling reason. Let me go ahead and quote him right here. But in general, the protective system of our day is conservative, while the free trade system is destructive. It breaks up old nationalities and pushes the antagonism of the proletariat and the bourgeoisie to the extreme point. In a word, the free trade system hastens the social revolution. It is in this revolutionary sense alone, gentlemen, that I will vote in favor of free trade. In other words, it is effectively a weapon of economical and cultural warfare which weakens the social cohesion, and Marx could not have been more right. I was very shocked to learn this, but apparently there are legitimate papers in academia addressing this. 
And his tactical support for free trade is the similar support for globalism by cultural Marxists to fasten up social conflict and subsequently collapse. This is well documented on the experiences of post-Soviet countries that were flooded with Western goods who brought with them modern liberal and degenerate culture as well as economical warfare. Similar thing is happening with the West as we speak, however this time it is waged by China and other Asian countries who flood the West with their TikToks, waging a cultural warfare and economical warfare by totally killing off the US television industry and soon car industry as a prime example. They are well aware of what their actions will lead to and will pursue them no matter what, because it would maximize their power and destabilize the power of the country which is importing their goods. Liberal regimes cannot last without a consensus and would eventually be replaced by something else, something that would actually stand for a certain vision of the future and liberalism stands for nothing, and therefore in the present time it can be considered to be obsolete. But what if there is one ideology that is striving off of it and is promising high status to low status people in exchange for political power? What if that new ideology is organizing heavily and challenging the liberal system rather strongly without being punished by it, as they are not perceived to be morally wrong because they agree with much of the enlightenment values that liberalism upholds, with the exception of reason part, as in some cases the so-called lived experiences must trump reason because it is a tool of white supremacy and you cannot dismantle the house of the master using its tools, to paraphrase Audre Lorde. Drum rolls, this new ideology, ladies and gentlemen, is Marxism operating through violinist methods, which shall be the end of the vicious cycle of liberalism that allowed it to happen and will undo its creator as some sort of a Star Wars reference. Now, to clarify myself from future scrutiny, when I say Marxism, I don't really mean economic Marxism in the Marxist-Leninist sense of the word, because that's just ridiculous and the elites will not play against their interests like that. Capitalism will remain the ruling economical ideology as it is useful for the elites and the economy and yeah, socialism is not. And if we look at the record of history and not some abstract conceptions, economical socialism also fails with common folk and capitalism is still the better alternative. Not at least we implement an even better system of course, but we'll have to wait for it. Instead, big capital and the elites will support a different form of Marxism, a cultural Marxism, in exchange for the commoner's support for capitalism but not liberalism. And this relationship, ladies and gentlemen, is what is called to be by a Leninist relationship. And the woke big capital already implements that, making once marginalized people the core defenders of capitalism by appealing to them mercilessly, thereby continuing economical liberal policy, which only works to enforce cultural Marxism, drive more social conflict and further decay social relations. And guess what? It works well for them. Ironically enough, big capital is saving capitalism by embracing far-left beliefs in an attempt to stay relevant. And frankly, leftists of this intersectional kind would eventually learn to accept capitalism as it defends their interests, making an even stronger bond with the new ruling ideology, which will protect the intersectional kind against any scrutiny and rent power against its enemies. This, ladies and gentlemen, would probably be the time when liberalism had transformed into a capitalist cultural Marxism. Though it is likely that capital would eventually adopt more leftist positions given the demands for more regulations and distributions of wealth and income among other things. I'm not saying that we are going to have some sort of a libertarian corporate government letting degeneracy run wild. Cultural Marxism would probably adopt some of the leftist economic causes, but it still would remain capitalistic. It would only kill the cultural aspect of liberalism, because it simply is not needed, as it is liberalism that had brought in by Leninist cultural Marxism in the first place, which now would reign supreme, and liberalism help is simply not needed, as liberalism could be used as a neutral platform that could be potentially used to challenge it by other actors. 
and why would they allow that? This is why you see further restrictions of freedom of speech and association and most tyranny coming from private corporations and institutions anyways and not the damn government. The tyranny would continue to come from those places until there are enough leftists to make this a mandatory governmental policy and only then we can talk about the oppression of the government. But anyways, that was a small rant. Let me repeat you my main message of the video and it is precisely that liberalism to them is nothing but a useful slut who was once a graduate from the Institute of Noble Maidens that is no longer needed because she had already fulfilled her role and instead of her being used by others she is sent to a concentration camp with her brain and genitals are removed to prevent other people doing something with it. And I guess my final thought is that maybe we ought not to pay for that surgery to return her to the original state, not until we meet the right prerequisite conditions and if we ever meet those we shall adopt Karl Popper's paradox of tolerance and frankly we ought not to make her appear as a slut but a proud woman of culture.